Hey, fashion entrepreneur, are you basing your business decisions on gut feeling versus using real data? Well, it's time to get over your arithmophobia. That's fear of numbers. I have GA4 expert Mia Umanos here with me today to help you feel more comfortable and confident using Google Analytics 4 for your e-commerce business. Mia Umanos is a 15-year veteran of marketing analytics who grew her career from junior to director of analytics inside Omnicom and JWT agencies. Her talent for balancing math and human empathy turns her projects into gold. She lifted revenue of $4 million in 90 days through conversion rate optimization, created a sustained 40% increase in ad revenue for a major publisher and won a Google News Initiative data grant for a Nobel Peace Prize winner. She now leads Clickvoyant, an AI-powered analytics firm for e-commerce companies. Please join me in welcoming my guest, Clickvoyant CEO and pioneer in using Google Analytics for Shopper Insight, Mia Manos. Welcome, Mia. It's so nice to have you here today. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Of course. Thank you for inviting me, Glynis. I really appreciate the invite. Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to have you here. Uh, we had met through a mutual friend, Carol Shi of Codespace, whom I had interviewed in a previous episode talking about the importance of community to overcome entrepreneurial challenges. So how did you first meet Carol? <laughs> Well, we were actually in San Diego at an event for female founders, and I was pitching clickvoyant artificial intelligence on stage, and Carol immediately found me and was like, I work with hundreds of e-commerce companies. They all need this. Who are you? Let's be friends. And we proceeded to be inse inseparable the entire conference. Amazing. Yeah sort of what my first impression of Carol was that she was just a very friendly, approachable person. Oh, yeah. And hilarious. As well. <laughs> just, I can't stop laughing when we're together. Oh, that's so great. So Codespace is also a, a partner agency with Click, Clickvoyant, right? Can you tell us a bit about that and how you work together? Yes. So Clickvoyant is an analytics only agency. All we do is data analysis for e-commerce companies. And so a lot of times Carol will refer to us and analytics and the development as the plumbing of all e-commerce shopping, uh, which is that we're kind of, you know, chummy because a lot of times it's the last thing that merchants and designers think about when, you know, you're very busy thinking about the business, the lines, planning, the logistics, sourcing materials, all of this stuff. And when it comes to this underbelly of code that lives, it's often because you can't see it or touch it, the last thing to think about. And yet the entire business is dependent on what we do. And so we feel like, you know, the invisible superheroes of e-commerce because if none of it works, the data nor the development, then all of the, you know, line planning products, it's for naught. So that's how we work together. And her, she's the CEO of a company which does the code for Shopify stores. And I am the CEO of a company that does the analytics for Shopify stores. Okay. That's great. Thanks for explaining that. Um, so what made you decide to become a, d a data analyst and like, how did you get first get into this industry? Well, I mean, the first getting into this interest industry was actually the, the bio is a little old. It was almost 20 years ago. So I first got into the industry around the time that MySpace was the primary social media platform to talk about. So it was a long while ago. And I think that my, my path begins really in journalism school. I wanted to be a science, um, a science journalist. And what I really liked about that was, A, I like to write and I like to distill complex concepts into something that is more palatable for the layperson to understand. So I like to do the digging to so figure out what is mathematically, scientifically going on and what's in the soup so that I can level up and tell the story about how it all works 
to the people who need to know about it. And so my my transition from broke journalist into data analyst was very natural because I could take the data from these websites and explain how behaviors are being impacted. Um, and people understood it. Not a lot of data people can do that. If you've ever worked with any data people or, you know, lots, lots of times you're opening up these different dashboards that you have access to and you just don't, your eyes kind of gloss over and you just want to put it down. <laughs> so I like to be the person to say, well, magically, here's what it says. Right. So, so we're covering a big topic today and that's Google Analytics 4. So I just want to jump right into it. Uh, we'll be focusing on using GA4 for e-commerce sites, as our listeners are mostly e-commerce store owners. Um, for those unfamiliar with GA4, can you explain some of the key differences between GA4 and Universal Analytics? Sure. Well, I think I might start a little bit further back and say, you know, in the world of e-commerce, there's usually three things that you need to look at the data to know if your business is healthy or unhealthy. And the first part is some kind of paid media dashboard. So if you're at the point where you can start spending money to try to get people to your store, then you're gonna wanna know how much are you spending? What is your return on ad spend? Like how many dollars do you get for every dollar that you spend? And you're gonna wanna see the revenue at the end of that. So the revenue is usually something that you get from a Shopify or maybe some of you are in WooCommerce even or BigCommerce, but that's data on the back end. It's like what comes out, what products are being sold, what is the margin, what coupons were being generated uh, or used. And that's what we call in marketing upper funnel data is the ads and then the lowest part of the funnel which is what is happening on the checkout but what is missing between those two is your middle part is like what are people doing actually in the store itself so all of the ways that we're comporting ourselves like we making this sale we're showing this line we're showing this season that's merchandising and the merchandising, you know, you know why your grocery store gives you that tag, right? They want to know where you go. They want to know what you're picking up, what you're putting back, because they study your behaviors to see like, well, what, what do you want to buy? What are you considering and what do you want to buy? Not many merchants fill in that gap, but that's where Google Analytics comes in. So Google Analytics is the place where you get all of your e-commerce website data. It is not out of the box. Um, and that's one of the real differences between Google Analytics Universal, which some people might know as the old Google Analytics. I actually know it as the second Google Analytics because I've been doing this a long time. There used to be a, a, a method of tracking data and a data architecture, which it's kind of a big vocabulary word, but data architecture to me, just how do we access the data and how do we store it? So the data architecture of Google used to be called on a thing called Urchin. Then it moved to a thing called Universal Analytics. And now it's moved to a thing called Google Analytics 4. And Google Analytics 4 is free. Google has always been free. But what Google Analytics 4 is, is an enterprise grade tool for free. So that just means that there's a lot more that you have to do to get the data in there than just put on a pixel on the Shopify or turn on the Shopify integration and I'm done. There's a lot more to get that shopper behavior clicks and swipes and gallery views. So, you know, when I say a lot more, I'm talking, okay, this can be anywhere from a $2,000 to a $5,000 to a $10,000 investment, depending on how big your site is and how complex it is. So when we're talking about a $2,000 investment to get this information inside Google Analytics, let's compare that to what sometimes companies of like a larger size are paying a triple whale who has many clients who are under 1 million in annual revenue charges seven minimum $700 a month. So if you think about like these other tools here that are $700 a month, you make a $2,000 investment over the long term. Your $2,000 investment up front will give you data forever for free. I mean, I'm forever is a superlative, but I'm I'm being I'm being fantastic to make a point. 
So that's it. Google Analytics 4 is, is enterprise grade. It takes a little bit more muscle to get that shopper information in there. But when it's in there, you can use this free tool forevermore to learn about how people shop in your store. What do they look at? What do they put back? Because mm. that's not data that's in either of the other platforms. Okay, so the Google Analytics 4's job primary function is to serve like the user behavior, right? It's to give you that that data. That's how I liken it. I mean, there are stages, honestly, Glennis, of analytics maturity. So um, in the stage where you have, you know, you're doing a data analysis and you're you're subscribing to a triple whale, which is seven hundred dollars, you're probably past a couple thresholds. In the very beginning, Google Analytics can actually function as the as the only tool, right? Or that plus Shopify. Yeah. So it's like I've got there is a component of Google Analytics that will allow you to do paid media, ROAS analysis. How are these channels performing? And when a company matures, there are some limitations to those reporting that basically if you've passed a certain amount of spend that you're going to want a bigger gun i guess that's a, might be a bad analogy but you know so there are stages of knowing when to invest in analytics and so google analytics can do a lot of these things i think revenue items sold forever should always come out of shopify like the most direct data point mm -hmm. that should come out of shopify but anything beyond that, like, okay, what are the campaigns? Google tracks that too. How much are we spending? If it's in Google ads, you can track that too. Google Analytics can also take your spend from your other platforms, Pinterest or TikTok, and put it into there. And then you can see how your campaigns are performing. So it can do a lot of things. Yeah. Is that a nebulous answer? Scratch the surface right now of even like what it's capable of doing. Like from my level of knowledge, I would just say I, you know, it's the tip of the iceberg. That's, mm -hmm. I only know that that much about it's like full capabilities of what it can do. And it can be a very powerful tool if you know how to use it properly. And I think that's kind of the, the challenge that a lot of business owners have is they don't even know where to start to look. <laughs> sure. And I mean, this is why I love talking about this to merchants and, and, you know, even startup founders, like I do a lot of, you know, webinars speaking, I do the class, obviously, I have it, I digitized that class just last week. So it could be on demand anytime. So if anybody wants to use that class, the coupon code is girl boss, and you can get in there for $7. At the end of the day, Glynis, like we talk about when a data-driven company and the education that I do for these, I mean, we're talking some big brands are, are not even using it in the way that I use it. So I'll give you an example of how helpful this actually is. Um, one company, apparel, you know, when you're making apparel, dresses are always like number one. I feel like it's always, like dresses are so number one a lot of the time, unless you're like jeans, right? Or... This company, big company, was only using these products that I was telling you, like they have a triple whale, they're looking at Shopify. After the class, they said, I think we realized that we were just looking at dashboards and then going about our business. We weren't really thinking about shopper behavior in any way and we weren't really changing any of our strategies as a result so in this instance what we saw were people because we implement we implemented for them all of these user experience navigation merchandising variables and then they could see um people who were shopping on sale and clicking there were actually had an average order value of half the average order value for the whole site. And it was in their top level navigation. So you get into the site, be some of these sites before, and you could see selling like, you know, if you're forever 21, that probably makes sense. But if you're a luxury brand, why would we be putting sale at the very top level navigation? So we took that out. This is a luxury brand. 
we took it out of the navigation, we stopped training people to shop for sales and their average order value went from $300 to 750 in 45 days. Wow. No more ad spend. Wow. So, right? Like that's basically doubling the revenue without spending any more on ads with one small thing that we don't even think about. That is incredible. Oh my God. And they wouldn't even have known that, I guess, if you hadn't come in to take a look at the data in terms of what people are clicking on, right? Right. Because yeah. it was just like, you know, if we, if we do a sale and this is, it's very, I, I think, you know, fashion stars are very like, oh, yeah. And I think that there is a, a true need for a sale, but I think that still should be strategic, mm -hmm. strategic pillars in a revenue model yeah. versus like desperation. Right. Or is like a, you know, it's you're training people to shop for sale when they're going on your site. What are they looking at? Top level navigation. So it's dresses, tops, just in. So we replaced, actually, we didn't just take it out, but we replaced the word sale from the top level navigation with just in. So we're training you to come to shop for our high ticket, most recent inventory and for you to want the latest from us, not to come here and shop for whatever's discounted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I myself do that. I'm an immigrant's daughter. Like doing, I'm very motivated by getting, like getting it for 75% off. That's to me yeah. is a badge, but it, you know, in some instances it doesn't matter. So when you're like, when you're changing your website and you're making these design choices, you're making the design choices for your best customer. And mm. that's where the data starts to lead you. Cause like the other thing is like, we had another swimwear company come to us and say, we've been around for 10 years. We do not know. We knew who we started out with and we don't know who our customer is now. Like we started out with this, like surfers, we're surfer girls, you know, like we're making the swimmer brand for surfers and outdoor women. And then 10 years later, after so many wonderkin apps and so many things and you're like who are we attracting we have no idea because the algorithms at the ads are just sending your your it's an algorithm sending people your ad and then people are buying and you don't know who they are so that's why it's critical to have the behavior because it'll the behavior starts to signal affinities for certain products price ranges and so forth Mm, okay. It's so powerful. Just <laughs> this example that you've given me, you know, by removing the sale banner off, how it just increased your average order from 300 to 750 instead of like making it a sale right off the bat on the top, people just go on, click on that, right? And then that's what they're training to do. But if you actually switch it out, and I guess you're using that data to understand like okay what are th what types of things are people looking or licking on i guess when people land on the site is that what you're mm -hmm. trying and then understand that and then changing that out to your new new products right is that what you you change the banner from the sale to new or just in is that what you you ended up doing right it wasn't technically a banner. There, there was no banners on this particular site because it's luxury, you know? And so, but it was in the navigation. Oh, like when you go and you first go to a website and you see, you know, all in the navigation, it was in the top. And so they switched that oh, out with wow. new, just in. Just in or new arrival. Or, or new or new arrivals, new lines. And then somebody, you train them to, to look there. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, people who are sales motivated are, are also good customers and we, and they will find it. <laughs> they will find the sale. And this is the thing that we, this is what data does when you get shopper behavior. It starts to elevate the different stories of who she is. Who is she? Who is this kind of shopper? How do I need to comport this page for her? You know, the wedding dress shopper, what is she like? right? The event, the occasion shopper, what does she care about? Mm -hmm. Or the price sensitive shopper, what does she care about? And you can make these different featured edits to comport, to, to call to them and be more empathetic 
to like comport your pages and your store to be more empathetic to that person. And that's the power of digital that you could never do in a department, right? Or, you know, everything is like best line. You know, if you walk into in store, it's like just whatever we think is the most stylish thing. But on digital, you can really start to comport the merchandising to the motivation of that person who's there that day. And it's just by creating these trails and on a homepage, you know, here's this for you, right? Or you, there's a navigation, that's clue one. Where am I going? Mia's gonna go to sales. <laughs> Mia's gonna go to clearance, right? Yeah. But somebody else might go, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lover of this brand. I wanna see what's the new line. They're gonna click there. So you find these like different clues on the homepage. There's a lot of things there as well. I mean, we, you know, people like carefully, artfully craft homepages and sometimes they don't realize, you know, some of the things that they might be doing to basically change behavior when you're creating all of these things. So mm -hmm. here's another example. Some of the things that we're discovering about the behavior data in a merchandise store is like, you see this all the time, Shopify Home Hero, then some headline and then some triptych. Right. It's like, and a triptych is three images, right? It's like three images, three right? Ag three images. Yes. When we see three images across, we often see the most clicks in the middle. And if you see two, a diptych, two images across, we see fewer clicks to something like that. So and, and this is just a hypothesis, but it's like the data is going to tell you one thing and then you, what you decide about how shoppers behave is another. So what I'm going to say to you is a hypo my hypothesis. I see the data. I'm making a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that a triptych allows for an eye to be drawn somewhere in the middle. Humans see with their brain, not with their eyes. So it's taking shortcuts. Oh, the one in the middle. Right. I don't know which one to pick. I'm going to click the one in the middle. Mm -hmm. When there's a diptych, it's often used as a comparison. It's like there's, well, these two are equal. If they're both equal, neither of them are important. Mm -hmm. So these are hypotheses that I start to think of, you know, and I'm, I'm a, I might, I might be a data person, but I am at the root, just interested in people. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in behaviors. This is why I wanted to be a science journalist at the beginning. Like I'm most interested in why do they do that? That's so interesting. So when I say, you know, data and scientific method, they're very intertwined. And so I'm always like very, very obsessed about the shopper behavior, why they are clicking on things that they're doing. And, you know, can I help get them to the places that they actually want to go? Right. So that's why, you know, when people take a look at what I put in Google Analytics, they're like, holy crap, <laughs> this is a lot of stuff. So they may not necessarily need to be tracking all that stuff. Is that what you're saying? Like, No, I'm saying that most companies don't, that they don't track all that stuff. Our clients do because mm -hmm. they now have seen the power of like, well, when I understand how shoppers behave, now I can change my site according to what is converting better which leads to a transaction yeah so what do you start with like first like maybe kind of walk us through your process a little bit of when somebody comes to you right with an e-commerce mm -hmm. store and they're like i'm what's the number one problem that people have the store yeah so so this is great actually the the number one problem the real trigger to become a clickvoyant client is that you like a company can get to a million dollars in annual revenue just by slugging it out and like dragging through the mud and sleepless nights it can get to a million dollars in annual revenue it can but it doesn't have to when at that getting to a million dollars in annual revenue and now you're spending ads what's happening with the companies that come to me is like oh mia we've been doing it like this forever and now our growth is plateaued we're flatlining and not only are we flatlining on revenue we're also increasing the cost per customer acquisition and our ROAS is going down like our ROAS when we started this company was like a four, a five, and now we're at like a two. It's terrible. Like we're barely breaking even. 
right? And so they come to me and it's like, well, I have these two pieces. I got Shopify, I have Triple Whale. I have upper funnel, I have not bottom of the funnel. I, I, I have nowhere else to go, but now start looking at my site. But the companies who look at their site and are obsessed with shopper behavior from the very beginning, they're not gonna have to go through that pain, right? Again, like for a small company, like a $2,000 investment, Lord knows you're spending way more on a lot of other things, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I'm getting the data. I can understand. I see how shoppers behave. I see what they add to cart. I mean, it's probably not appropriate if it's like a pre-revenue company, obviously. But when you start to get to a place where like, all right, I mean, I've got like a thousand visitors a month, you know, I have a thousand people looking here a month. Like, why aren't they buying? That's enough data. Or even like five or 600 people a month. It's enough to start looking at well, why aren't they buying? Why are they buying? And how do I comport the site design to make sure that it's easy for them to navigate, easy for them to understand why I'm the one that they want to buy from? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is like a little bit of an easy process, which maybe it's easy to me, but I know that you just took the course. So maybe you have a different opinion. But it's like looking at all of the things that we have, like all the plugins, the wonderkins, the quizzes, the, all these things, the size function, the like accordions on a product detail page and look and see, do you have that data? And if you don't, those are usually the places that we start. It's like navigation. What are people doing in a product detail page? Where is the add to cart coming from? Is it from an upsell widget? Is it from a rebuy app? Is a, is a bundling upselling, like where's this, let's put in those data points. And when that doesn't become enough, you add more. So you're enriching the data as you're maturing your business. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that stuck with me, I remember the first time I took the course and you telling me the story about how a lot of companies think they're, they want to increase revenue. So the first thing they do is, you know, adding more products. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Like you told yeah. another story about how you were able to look, you know, kind of dig in deep and see, understand the customer behavior and help them to increase their average order value, increase sales in turn without even having to, you know, add more products, that sort of thing. Is that? Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. it's like when you're a business and you want to grow, you're going to grow in the ways that you know on what you know what to do, right? So I know that when I make product, people buy product, right? And so I think that that can be one of these ways that, you know, most companies who are just maturing to understand analysis and their data, well, I mean, before they get to that stage, they'll just say, oh yeah, let's release more things. And then product will start churning out. And, you know, I mean, the real, the real root of true business growth in an e-commerce setting is to understand your customer acquisition cost, your new customer, basically you your customer acquisition cost, the product efficiency, meaning, okay, of these products, one of my favorite metrics to look at so we should get into that. My favorite metrics to look at is like a cart to detail and a purchase to detail rate. Those are the percentage of people who view a product or the percentage of people who add to cart or a percentage of people who purchase a product over the total amount of times that that product was viewed. So if you've got a high view and a low add to cart rate, it's either the product or the page that's not doing it. But what we like to see if there's like an add to cart rate on all these pages or a purchase to a, a good metric to get to is a 6% uh, car, a view, like a purchase to view rate. If you get there's 6% of views end up in a purchase, it's a pretty good marker. If you're below that, I'd be concerned about that product. So a lot of companies don't know how to look at their product efficiency ratios on a site. Some of them are like, like I've never even heard of this, even mature businesses. So if a business that's starting out, like a lot of your audience is like, okay, this is a metric I need to pay attention to. 
how, how much does it cost to pay, you know, how much does it cost to get a customer and what is my product efficiency ratio? Because I'll tell you, we do a lot of analysis on here's all the revenue that you're creating. And here, a, a lot of times our a metric that I see a lot is 98% of your revenue was generated by 5% of products. Think about that. Almost 100% of your revenue is generated by 5% of your SKUs. Wow. Like if it, I mean, think about all the churn expense overhead to make those other 95 products, yeah. right? I mean, we're not all forever 21. <laughs> we can't just churn out garbage, right? Like we can't do that as a business. We have to pick. And so when we like, I think that the more merchants know and startup companies, any anybody, whatever mm -hmm. you're selling, is start to look at product efficiency ratios. Like if you if you say, okay, this is gonna set me free from having to just churn out product. There are other ways to grow my business. Okay, so um, just to emphasize what we just talked about is um, an important metric to look at would be the product efficiency rate, which is something that I just, I don't hear about that often. I'm not sure if many people have or even know about it. I mean, it's, no. is that what you come across with a lot of people? Oh, yeah. Uh, don't even know about this. Yes. <laughs> but it's an important Any metric. I get business. like average order value. I hear like, you know, customer acquisition. I hear, you know, conversions. It's really not known. I think that, you know, actually I was just talking to another client of mine, jewelry, jewelry company, and she said, Mia, you really need to go out there and start talking to some of these accelerators for uh, e-commerce accelerators, because we went through product, logistics, line, business model. There was nothing about a D2C analytic strategy. In a, a D2C analytic strategy in e-commerce startup <laughs> accelerators. I was like, what the heck? That's insane. So, I mean, that's why I'm out here now. I'm like, I'm, I'm like going hard on content because she told me that literally over like a week ago <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, okay, I'm on a mission now. Like if that's true, you just went through a startup accelerator hosted by a very well-known e-commerce startup accelerator and you did not have any analytics mm -hmm. training, then I'm going to die on that hill. I don't care. That's my new, that's my new thing. I'm going to die on that hill because there's so many great brands, right? So many. And like, I, I'm particularly fond of female run startups. Like it will always be, I mean, I will always make myself available. I am a female founder myself. So I know how hard it is. Oh yeah. I mean, they're, they've got a million things going, right? They're, um, juggling a lot and you know wearing a lot of hats and they're probably not focusing like or even know you know they don't know what they don't know right so mm -hmm. i think it's just having that awareness first of all which you, is what you're doing uh but there's so many things that are taking away their attention right of what they think they should be focusing on and you know i think it's like social media is a big one and i think mm -hmm. that I should be doing spending their time on but not really looking at a lot of the numbers i find that that's what they're not looking at um and i think it's maybe because you know if they are even are able to um have the data get the data but they won't, they won't know what to do with it right, right. Mm -hmm. um for that so so what advice would you give to e-commerce businesses that are just starting out with GA4, they feel overwhelmed by the data. Like how can GA4 be able to help them simplify and streamline the process of identifying um, meaningful trends and the data and so, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I would say like thing number one is like if you have really expensive tools that you're spending money on to just stop that right away and start looking at Google Analytics because you're not mature enough for a $700 a month tool. It's, it's like, and Lord knows you can't burn through cash right? You cannot burn through cash. So if you're spending, so that's like thing one, don't just go and start to like spend 
a ton of money on a tool that you're going to ignore. Cause frankly, that's what happens a lot. hundred dollars a month is a lot of money. So the second thing that I would say is take the GA4 class, wake up, get a grip on it. It's easy to take. I'm easy to talk to. The concepts are hard, but I mean, you say me, like, what did you get out of it? Like, did you, you, if you get, if you get nothing but a better understanding of what it's for, I've done my job. Yeah, that's what I would say. I got out of that, your course and the course we're referring to is a your your four day GA four boot camp, um, which was amazing. I mean, you know, I I, I wouldn't say I'm like an expert at GA four. I'm not even close to that, right? Like I understand a bit. I use it as a tool and I do SEO, um, but you know, it, that like I just know the basic basics really. Um, but I think your course really just opened my eyes to what is possible out there and I feel like I know a little bit more about it now and at least that's sort of now on my radar right yes. so when, I'm, when I'm talking to clients and stuff and hearing about like certain problems that they're having with their web websites maybe not performing or whatever you know they're not hitting their goals and you know okay then I could perhaps prescribe something to help them do that or for mm -hmm. them to an expert like you if they want more help with it or something like that at least I know about it yeah absolutely I think getting it on the radar is the is the most is like step one know that it's there know what it's for it's for website shopping behavior if you're having a problem there you you've got that in your in your in, in your in your in your bookmark right yeah. and then I think the next thing is you know like taking the course is helpful but as well like Take it in little bites. Like, don't try to, you know, boil the ocean. Just like if you're if you're thinking about okay, an add to cart rate or the cart to detail in Google Analytics called the cart to detail and the purchase to detail. Those two metrics, and you're looking by product. It's going to help you understand what products are performing and what ones aren't performing so good. Mm -hmm. And again, if they're not performing good in those two metrics, it's either the product or the page. So you get two things, like one thing you could change easily, which is the page and mm -hmm. experiment there. And if that doesn't work, then, you know, it's a product. Mm -hmm. Put that thing on sale right? yeah. and move on. Yeah. And don't wait too long to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It'll, yes. It'll, it'll move fast enough, I think, and sit on it, hoping that, OK, maybe it will pick up or something. And then maybe they just like lost that, I don't know, opportunity or something. Um, where they, oh, they yeah. kind of moved it a lot faster. Um, but uh, um, I know we're sort of running out of time, but um, there's some terminology I just want to cover um, when it comes to analytics and the two words that come up a lot often in your course, especially you mentioned data architecture and mm -hmm. data layering. Can you just please mm -hmm. explain what those two things are? Yeah, absolutely. So data architecture just refers to the structure of how the data is built in Google Analytics. So basically, Google Analytics, a lot of people turn it on and they put on the Shopify integration. They go, oh, this isn't very helpful at all. And it's because they haven't put all the shopper data in there. Now, when you put the shopper data in there, there are some considerations for how you're going to get it out, which is, OK, I can do a CTA click, but I also want to know what that but it was, what did it say? Did it say shop now? Did it say shop the season? What did it say? You want to know because you want to know how you're talking to your customers. So the data architecture is of all the things that we want to track, where do I put it? It's like organizing a garage or organizing your kitchen drawers or your pantry. It's like, okay, well, you know, anything that's a button click is going to go here and it's going to go things that are the add to cart type is going to go here. So are they POS? Are they user experience? Is it a messaging? That's what we refer to it with data architecture. And so the way that it's going to be familiar to most of your listeners is like, well, when you're deciding on the navigation, you're deciding on an architecture of a website. So it's going to be dresses. And then within dresses, it's going to be petites and regular or whatever, right? If a pants, it's going to be jeans. It's going to be, the, that's also a data architecture, your navigation. So your data architecture is really just the way in which we structure the information so that people can access it. 
and your website navigation, that's your data architecture for how your customers can access your products. In GA, the data architecture is referring to how are you or your marketing people going to access the information of every click and swipe that happens in the store. Now, the second piece, which is the data layer, the data layer is a bit of code, actually, that lives on your site. It doesn't have anything to do with the front end, but it's all these little pieces that live in the code that exchanging that is exchanging between Shopify, Google Analytics, and your ad platforms. So for example, in the data layer, there'll be things that when you're looking at a product detail page, inside the data layer will be things like product name, red dress, product category, dress, or you know the, the name might be something snazzier like Alyssa, the Alyssa, right? That's your product name. The category is dress. The item category two might be fall 2024 line. So there's this, it's, it's the metadata that is passing so that other places can pick it up. That's the easiest way that I can think about it. Like these secret messages that you're putting into your data that nobody's really seeing, but that allows you to know that when that product, the Alyssa dress goes from cart to view or viewing to a cart to a checkout, that all that metadata is passing so that you can do that analysis later and say, hey, everything from season 2024, fall 2024 is tanking as a bad product efficiency. We had a, we had a bad line planner that, 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 that season. So, um, so that's what those two are about. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense now. Um, when we were speaking meta tags and that's totally, you were speaking my language. Yeah. SEO, we do look at site structure. It's part of the technical SEO checks that we do, it's, right? Um, making things sure things are categorized properly, put in the proper collections, folders, right? And mm -hmm. products are named properly. Um, and then I look at the URLs, URL structures and all that stuff as well, because that tells search engines like what the product is. Mm -hmm. So I think the same goes with, with Google. Well, it's, yeah, the same search engine um, that we're using. Um, the better you're able to categorize, organize things on your website, not only does it make a better user experience, right, for your customers, mm -hmm. but it also helps with Google. Sure. And I mean, at the end of the day, there's like a data analyst human, and then there's the data analysis algorithms, and we need the data to be in a certain structure to be able to do our jobs. So that's why if you have a bad structure, it's hard to show up. And, and as well, if you have a bad structure, it's hard to analyze shopper preferences because it's the same, same outcome, different products. But that's what metadata really, yeah, that, that data layer is the metadata uh, on products um, and shopper experience that we need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so before we wrap up here, what size businesses do you usually work with? Um, like you had mentioned some costs here in terms of like a $2,000 investment that is that generally how it works? Like you have a package or like how can somebody get started? Um, they, they want, if they want help from you. Yeah, I mean, it really, it definitely not pre-revenue. I'm happy to, you know, get anybody into the classes. I think when, when a company is starting to generate revenue and they really want to start, they want to make all the right moves and they don't want to make any mistakes and they want to be data-driven and not product just driven. Like actually a, a CFO uh, to e-commerce companies told me this once recently this week and she said, well, a lot of these e-commerce companies are either building a business or they're building a brand. And one of the other two is neglected often. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times in the beginning, you're building a brand. You're like, I just want people to know who I am, right? But to build a business, you really need to be data-driven. So if you're in a stage where you're building a business and you've bought into that, then the beginning, we, we start at $750 a month to help with support that as a retainer. Um, we also have, you know, we scale to $2,000 a month for like deeper services. And we also do conversion rate optimization where we're actually scientifically testing websites. And that starts at $6,000 a month. So, you know, not for beginning, really beginning companies, but for companies who are, you know, at the stages where we, well, we really don't want to make too many mistakes. If you want to take an engineering approach to our business, we're building a business. We're not just building a brand. If you're in that mindset, then it makes sense. 
Amazing. So I know we just really scratched the surface of what J4 can do. Um, and really for a deeper dive, I recommend you take Mia's four day GA4 bootcamp. Or you'll it's learn. just an hour a day too. It's not yeah. like four days. Like yeah, it's exactly. an hour a day. Yeah. Four full days. It's an hour a day over four days. Um, but you'll learn uh, how to harness the full potential Google Analytics for to drive better business decisions. Um, do you know when your next workshop is going to be? Yes, it's November 18th. So Monday, November 18th to Thursday, November 22. Okay, amazing. Um, and maybe you can provide a link uh, where people can sign up for that. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you? Well, strangely, I'm the only Mia Umanos in like all of the internet. I don't know how that happened, but I am. I am the one. <laughs> so you can search for me. You can look, find me on LinkedIn. But my email address is mia at clickvoyant.com. I have an open door. Uh, most founders, I have a very soft spot for, for you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Mia, for being thank you, here Glennis. today, sharing your expert insight into GA4 and data analysis with us. Wonderful. I appreciate you. You're very welcome. Thank you.